right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another of Cybrin's uh, Game Changers. And uh, particularly looking forward to this one. The reason, by the way, for the funny time that we've got this is <laughs> these are not my words. I'm just replicating or copying uh, because we're interviewing some women in Canada. We'll dig into what that means in a minute with Tashmir once we go and do the introductions. As always, please ask your questions. Um, this is what I think makes these types of calls special. It's not just a presentation or a keynote, and it's not just like a radio interview. We actually want you to be participating, asking your questions. That's what makes it exciting. I, I try to guess what it is that you're interested to hear about, but I can't. I'm not very good at it. Ask your questions, please. With that, I'm going to hand over to Carabo. Please do the intros. Absolutely. Thank you, Colin. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Carabo Moloko. I'm the CEO of Cyber in South Africa. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, you are in for a really, really great session today. So uh, as you, as Colin started us off, um, Colin is the founder of Innovation Catalyst, and he's very instrumental in helping courageous leaders transform their companies with disruptive interventions. So if you're stuck, uh, you need a Colin shake, as I call it. So it's been mm -hmm. really exciting and vibrant to be working with them. Uh, but also joining us, we've got Kashmir here. She's the vice president of Mars Discovery District and founder of the YES program. For those of you that don't know YES, it's a youth employment service program. It was a joint initiative between business, labor, and government with an aim to address South Africa's unemployment challenge and create over a million work experiences for South Africans. Now, this is the one joint program that actually works and is delivering results. And we are seeing just the caliber of young South Africans getting the right experiences and CVs to enter the job market. And I'm excited to say that Cybran is a proud participant of the YES program. And we've got candidates working in our AI solution and machine learning and we're making sure that they're getting quality experiences that are making them absolutely marketable. Um, you're gonna hear it today, uh, Tashmir's got extensive knowledge in just around business models, strategies, designing learning programs, and um, she's written and conducted her own learning programs on economic inclusion, design thinking, and innovation, and I know we're gonna to touch a lot of that. So ladies and gentlemen, we are kicking off Women's Month um, with just a real powerhouse and a game changer, one of South Africa's most inspirational women. And you guys know the theme this year around Women's Month and International Women's Day that we had was around breaking the bias. And I know Tashmir breaks those bias and the boxes that I think the world is probably trying to keep her in, in a real and practical way. So be inspired. We look forward to your interaction uh, today and a really great webinar. Um, Colin, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So over to me, but actually over to some lady, maybe not woman, maybe some lady over in Canada, the great, and the only just started in many ways, Tashmir Ishmael. And I'm going to come back to what I mean by that, because she truly is a game changer. And you can see she's very young and there's many years ahead in terms of the possibilities. She's already had massive impact in South Africa. She's now, unfortunately, for the South Africans, having massive impact over in Canada. I'm not going to introduce her CV in the normal way. We'll touch that as we get into it, because I think that's really interesting as a, as a story to go along with the uh, 1st of August, it's Women's Month in South Africa, and some of the successes and failures and troubles and um, issues that she's had to deal with to get to where she is now. I'm going to start with a really simple opening question for you, Tashmir. What is inclusive innovation? So we all know what we're going to be uh, learning about on this call. Inclusive innovation is uh, designing inside of your organization business models that work not just for the company, but they allow for company growth. And at the same time, they have an impact on society where they allow for community and societal growth. Um, other names for this are, are shared value models, but inclusive innovation, I think, goes a little bit deeper into frugal innovation, um, how you use innovation to make your products and services accessible. And in the delivery of your products and services, that you're actually giving and empowering uh, business owners, communities, um, and people to thrive at the same time. 
Does that, How did you, does that package it well? <laughs> yeah, I think so. But we're going to come back to it because I think a lot of people listening to that, you know, um, maybe it is a bit vague. I mean, inclusive innovation, is it uh, sort of CSI initiatives? We're trying to help people, you know, along the way. And I think it puts off a lot of people, which is a good thing, because I want to get to that later about why it shouldn't put people off. OK, you're now in Canada. What on earth are you doing out there and who are Mitax? Because I think that's important for context about just how successful you've been. Mitax is an awesome organization. It is. Um, I, I think believe every country should have a, a, a Mitax in, in their economy. Mitax is an NGO, so I, I, um, I do tend to work at NGOs, but it's, it's a massive national and global NGO that works to take knowledge pipelines and talent um, find that talent and match it to industry partners to help them with their growth. We know that a very big ingredient in the recipe for innovation, which happens at industry level, is having the right talent in the mix um, to enable that innovation to re be realized. And uh, uh, MyTax finds the, the AI talent, the quantum talent, the business services talent, wherever it might lie in the world and in Canada and makes that available to industry partners to accelerate their innovation. So it's very much around knowledge pipelines and knowledge networking um, to drive innovation. There's a, there's a very particular flavor to innovation that comes out of Canada. Um, we see you know, big clusters of innovation, the Silicon Valleys of the world, the US is, uh, has got a few of these hotspots, but you know, that, that, that innovation tends to be innovation just for growth. Um, whereas a lot of the innovation that you see coming out of Canada is, is, is inclusive in nature. Um, it's innovation that works for people, planet and profit. Um, almost triple bottom line innovation, uh, where we see um, incredible leaps in technology in in, in, in the sustainability and environmental realm around carbon capture and reforestation, um, uh, new, new sources of food forms, um, you know, biotech, the use of algae. Um, we, we saw mRNA vaccines coming out of, out of Canada. So the, the, the innovation here, here really does have a flavor to it, um, which, which differentiates it from uh, innovation hotspots around the world. So we're at the forefront of really beneficial innovation here. I mean, this um, at the cutting edge of science and technology, this sounds a big step beyond just simply having another FinTech uh, or maybe another e-com platform. Absolutely, so, uh, and, and, and it's in the purpose and the outcome of that innovation. Um, you know, uh, uh, an ordinary FinTech platform or innovation in FinTech uh, would see some kind of um, either incremental or disruptive change that drives the company's growth and market, whereas an inclusive fintech innovation uh, will drive costs down. So it makes the service accessible to a market that can really use it to drive their own prosperity. Um, it gives the type of access that wasn't available before. There, there is an element to it that allows for the inclusion and accessibility of a group that would have been excluded previously. And that would be the difference. All right. Now, when you're in an organization that is really must be working with some incredibly clever people, I mean, we're talking about something that's been around for two decades or more. Um, this is well beyond just a sort of government sponsored entity. I mean, tens of millions of dollars are injected into this organization every year to go and, and to drive innovation, inclusive innovation, and build out the prospects for Canada as a country over the next coming decades. Why on earth do they reach out to you, Tashmir? Because you're not from Canada. You're, you've been living happily in South Africa for years and years and years. How on earth did they find you? And, and couldn't they find someone locally? So it's, it's hundreds of millions of dollars because um, the Canadian government and MyTax understands how important talent is in the innovation ecosystem. And bringing fresh talent and fresh ideas into industry is a, really is a vital ingredient. Um, I would say that the work that I did at the Youth Employment Service set me up uniquely. I, um, I do believe in, in, in global innovation networks. And 
you, you know, a, a country is never going to thrive if it thinks it has all the ingredients inside its own borders. The same with a company. You know, no company has the resources inside of itself to be able to keep up with the pace and rate of innovation in the world. And um, being able to bring cognitive diversity uh, from people with other country experiences, other industry experiences into your mix um, is, is, is really beneficial for firms. And, you know, this was uh, for, for three years, I worked with Professor Barnard at, at Gordon Institute of Business Science on a global innovation networks project, uh, which was funded by the EU. It was a 3.2 million dollar, a million euro um, innovation project to study global innovation networks. And the findings were very clear. You need knowledge networks that come from outside your firm to drive your competitiveness. And South Africa really needs to work on ways in which it links itself up um, to global talent uh, in, in order for us to thrive. And uh, this, this goes against the grain of the very xenophobic style of thinking we've seen emerge in South Africa, um, which is going to be very dangerous for the country's growth and for it to thrive. We need to connect, we need to talk to strangers. This is the big thing in open innovation. They say, talk to strangers, it's a good thing, ignore your mother's advice. And in the innovation space, this means connecting with talent from around the world. Um, and, and we've got to appreciate the value that that brings into a business and an economy. So my tax um, uh, saw that in South Africa, that uh, in the youth employment service, at the end of my tenure there, we'd done about 65,000 youth placements into, into jobs. Um, and of course, under the new CEO, Ravi Pillay, that number has now moved to over 82,000 uh, placements for youth, which is a massive number in South Africa. It would make it uh, the highest impact um, employment program driven by the private sector. It's very important to note that all of those YES salaries come from the private sector. There's no government funding involved in YES. So this is, this is a private sector initiative to push uh, employment and opportunities for young people. And um, currently, I would uh, estimate that the salaries that have gone from the private sector into young people through the YES program is, is, is over 4.5 billion rand. Um, so, so the impact of one NGO with one policy change initiated by government can have massive impact like this because it was built around all these inclusivity principles, Colin, that we described. How on earth did you get started on that? Because when you think about the impact of yes, it is massive. I think that 4 billion plus you know, salary number is the one that really stood out for me. But when I look at it, it feels really complex because in high level terms, the aim of yes is to you know, open up job opportunities for youth. That could be of you know, pretty much multiple ages, different sexes, living in different jurisdictions, different skills, trying to get access to different companies, companies who may or may not be interested in uh, being propositioned and being asked to go and take on these um, these potential future employees for the uh, the future of South Africa. But how? So when I look at this, I go, God, that that feels like a really difficult thing to even know where to get started and focus your attention on. How did you go about it? Well, again, it's it's um, you know networks are really important. Uh, yes, was actually born out of the CEO initiative. This was a whole lot of business leaders coming together and the importance of business in driving uh, inclusion uh, cannot be underestimated. These business leaders um, control, you know, swathes of the economy, have massive resources at their fingertips. And when you can uh, uh, um, switch that on, when you can turn that engine on, um, there's incredible power in, in the change that it can drive. So these CEOs came together in the CEO initiative and they um, were in talks with government and labor. This was at the time we were facing our first sovereign ratings downgrade. And the question was, what do we need to do to try to turn some of this around? And there were five speed boats that they talked about uh, driving with, with business leaders, uh, sitting behind those and, and driving those. And they, they were around a job summit, they were around youth employment, uh, small business creation, etc. And uh, the Youth Employment Service was one of those ideas. It was a twinkle in the eye of the CEO initiative. 
um, Stephen Kossif and Colin Coleman, Stephen Kossif of, of Investec and Colin Coleman um, hired me to operationalize what and to build a strategy around what this would look like. And uh, you know, through these networks of business leaders, um, I was able to access levels of government, went to, to every minister at, at the time, this was in the last uh, year of, of, of Jacob Zuma as the country's president, went out, to, uh, uh, went out to all of these ministries to see where we could find um, some kind of government give that would match the, the corporate contribution to driving youth employment. And we found, um, we found Sympatico at, at the Department of Trade and Industry, where we worked with policymakers to design the YES policy, which would incentivize uh, the private sector by rewarding them with one or two levels up on the VEE scorecard if they invested in youth jobs. And, and this, this was a real shift because it was private sector driven. It was working really closely with, um, with policymakers and it was a carrot, not a stick approach where you were incentivized uh, to do the right thing. And of course, you know, um, what, we, what we started to see was, uh, the, let me give you the example of VW. VW has been a massive YES supporter taking YES youth cohorts into the Eastern Cape plant and operations around the country from inception. And uh, their, their CEO at the time, Thomas Schaefer, said uh, that, that, that the YES program forced their HR department to look at CVs from groups of people they would never have considered before. People would not have had access to this type of job. But in opening up and shifting their mindset around who they employed, they were able to discover absolute gems um, in those YES cohorts. And we started to find the story um, replicating itself amongst many of our partners saying, well, when we shifted how we thought about who we hire and what we look for, um, we started to open our organizations up to talent, fresh talent that, that brought a real breath of fresh air into this organization. Um, and and we, we really are finding amazing people in these cohorts. And, and I think that's what we've got to think about in South Africa from uh, an employment perspective and economic growth perspective is if we don't, you know, open up these, um, this very tight, closed uh, business space to the wider economy and create the channels to allow for inclusivity. We're missing out on harnessing a, a huge resource the country has, which is large numbers of young people that do have value to offer. But programs like YES are, are too few. Uh, you know, how do we create more organizations that yes, that use like yes, that use policy, that use incentives, we need more tax incentives, there is the employment tax incentive, but more of that, to encourage people to open channels to this diversity um, of resource that we have in the country. Very cool. Now I've opened up the chat because I'm asking people to post their questions at the chat close. So now there are no excuses for people that you may know, Adrian. I'm sure you actually know Zaf, you know, Seren, you know, Shane, Rian, Michael, and everyone else that's on the call do post. It would be a shame if it's just my questions. How did um, you actually test this idea? Because to me, this is very much an incentive scheme. You've got to go and find that right incentive to get the company's interest. And I'm assuming that once you had your first two cornerstones in place, two or three big companies, the floodgates opened up a little bit. When we've got these guys, it was a bit easier to get other people to buy into it. But what was the uh, the sort of testing to get the, the right model up and running? Or did you just say, we're doing this and we're going for it and, and uh, it worked out all right and it's been iterated since? No, so we, we used a lot of the um, innovation frameworks to come up with the, the right model. We used Lean Startup as an example. You know, in its early days, we were a very small team with, with uh, limited resources. Um, so it was a lot of test and learn, many, many workshops with partners in the ecosystem um, to test sort of prototype designs on what that, that incentive would look like, what would work for companies, even after the amendment was passed, the legislative amendment was passed and the policy was written we were still able to work with the Department of Trade and Industry and further amendments 
um, to that policy note were made as we tested and ran yes in market and understood where some of the constraints were, we were constantly able to uh, iterate on that model. So, so used a, a lot of design thinking principles actually um, and inclusive innovation uh, um, know-how um, to design the YES program. In fact, I, I feel as though when, when I uh, was in the process of building, building YES uh, with my team, almost all of the years of innovation and inclusive innovation thinking and models were brought to bear and, and, and culminated almost in this, in this YES design. Um, I almost felt like the rest of my career was preparing me uh, to be able to put this together. And, um, you know, I had, I had worked quite a few multinationals in my consulting days, uh, helping them with inclusive innovation models. So, so an example is uh, um, GlaxoSmithKline and Unilever. For Glaxo, I built the Grand Pospasa Academy. And we did a massive national campaign to work with mom and pop stores, spaza stores around the country. Uh, Grandpa wanted to leave this legacy in communities of giving, empowering people to move forward. And we created the first township mini MBA. Case studies were, were created that were built around Spaza store business challenges. Um, and we initially taught this in classrooms in townships. We found classrooms and, and were, were delivering this curriculum. Uh, we published in the Daily Sun over uh, 12 weeks these case studies and activities for businesses. We got into Soweto TV. And then uh, uh, Glaxo was, was really interested in scaling this because in a face-to-face -face model, you can only go so far. And we created the first digital, I would say, digital, digital MBA with telenovela-style films. The case studies were, were turned into little films. Um, and we had coaches in communities that would work with these uh, business coaches in communities to work with these spaza store owners and getting them together once a week for peer learning sessions based on that content that we delivered digitally. Um, so, you know, all of those types of programs we brought into YES and every YES youth now gets a smartphone and that smartphone is embedded with applications and those applications deliver further training, soft skills training, uh, behavioral nudges to young people. And the YES program has actually uh, logged uh, over 11 million learning minutes um, on those apps. And these are young people in the most rural communities. There's a beautiful documentary. I encourage you to find it um, on, on YouTube. Maybe Colin, you can post the link on a group of YES youth through Conservation South Africa out in Namakwa. Uh, who are teaching emerging farmers how to farm sustainably, how to manage water resources, doing the most amazing sustainability work in this community. And these young people out in, uh, you know, really the most rural communities are able to access this learning um, on their smartphone, which is zero rated, the apps are zero rated. So they access this knowledge and learning free of charge. And, uh, and, and this is inclusive innovation. This is making this learning and job opportunity accessible to people no matter where they are. And 61% of these yes placements are young women in the, you know, going with the theme of, um, of Women's Month. Uh, many of these are, are, are young women, 61% are young women uh, that are able to work in their communities and access this where they can be close to their children and they don't need to spend large amounts of money on transport to try to find these jobs um, and being close to their community and kids during the day. Don, the floodgates have opened and all the questions are coming in now. So I'm going to have to get my last ones in now because I can do that. So well, it won't be my last one, I will, but I will get to you. I just want to ask this one thing. You've started in Canada. I started it in Canada and I understand inclusive innovation there. Government you know, sponsored NGO trying to do good for Canadians overall. Yes, you have to be inclusive. This is what politicians are meant to worry about. Um, very much the same with, yes, there's a really cool system, but trying to drive for an improvement across society. I want to ask the elephant question here. Can inclusive innovation really benefit companies from a, you know, with profit standpoint when that is their sole focus? Absolutely. And, and there's empirical evidence that is, is, is showing us how important um, triple bottom line reputation um, the, the the most high growth brands in the world today 
uh, what do they have in common? They have a, a core purpose that is, that is driven as part of their business strategy. Um, employees today want to work for organizations. We've seen this shift, want to work with organizations that have purpose. So from an organizational perspective, if you are a purpose-driven organization, you're gonna attract and retain the best talent. But on the consumer side, on the market side, we also see that consumers um, across, uh, in South Africa, we still use the term LSMs, but consumers across LSMs, across economic strata, are interested in buying from and supporting organizations that they can see having a positive impact on society. And then if we go to your actual consumers in market in mass market segments, through all the years of research that I've done working in township communities in South Africa, those consumers have an absolute radar for BS. They know when a company is delivering real value um, that is, is, and they don't mind paying for it. Uh, you know, there's, there's a myth that low income consumers want cheap. They want value. Um, and, and when they see a brand or a company delivering real access and a real value proposition um, that is both beneficial to their community and they don't mind to the company, those brands develop a loyalty, a brand loyalty that is very hard to shake. So you want to be that first brand that comes in there with purpose in mind, with a genuine value proposition, because that is going to win you market. People cannot afford to make mistakes on products. They cannot afford uh, in, in their lives to just test something out and hope that it works. Um, so brands that, that really understand this and, and, and deliver a value proposition where people aren't wasting their money and uh, berating themselves for the purchase afterwards, they build a real long-term brand loyalty um, that, that will be the envy of your competitors. And I think we can mention names. I mean, brands that we have discussed and maybe many would be thinking about Patagonia and, and perhaps more locally Discovery, maybe Unilever, Lifebuoy Soap. That's always a great case study. But you had a great one, Semex, in um, South America. In fact, Semex was, was a very, very early case study. I think that even preceded Prahalad's famous uh, Business at the Base book. Um, Simex, as a, as a global multinational, um, saw that uh, you know, economic uh, rises and dips caused, caused havoc with its, um, you know, with it, with its income statements and, and, and balance sheets and wanted to um, make a foray into mass market segments to see if they could build a more steady revenue base in, in, uh, in mass market segments. And they decided to do this in Mexico. And their first attempt at uh, trying to, 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 to drive this was just very much a commercial product-based view. They shrunk the bags of cement. They thought if we make smaller bags of cement and we charge uh, a, a lower price for them, we're gonna sell cement. And they burnt their fingers terribly. And they did a, a very dramatic um, thing. They signed a declaration of ignorance where the company executive said, we know nothing about this market. We must start with a beginner's mindset. Um, they, they spun out, um, they created an incubator uh, 500 kilometers from their main head office. I think it was in Guadalajara, if memory serves. And they started to understand the market through immersion, went out into communities, spent time understanding. And they said, ah, the problem is not the, the sale of cement, the problem is people have trouble with home building because mm. you've got to be able to do this in a modular fashion because you don't have all the money in one go. We need financial planners to help families put the money together. We need to build in a modular fashion so they can do one room at a time. We need social services because this is hugely stressful on families and, um, and, and families break in the process of, of home building. So they created an ecosystem of support around home building. It wasn't about selling cement, but you know what? The cement sold when they got the ecosystem of support right around how yeah, it's, it's, it's brilliant, isn't it? You know, Discovery trying to help, um, help people live longer and Lifebuoy Soap trying to solve for dysentery and diarrhea in communities. The product becomes secondary, it becomes um, homogenous, which is, um, 
I mean, I'm sure many people have, have thought about this before. By the way, the financial services that we need to get them doing this declaration of ignorance in how to go and solve for the mass mart of uh, people out there that just can't access financial services because it's too expensive, too complicated. But maybe that's <laughs> that's for a different time. How? So I get it. You get it. And I'm sure a lot of people do. But this question, I think, from Carabo is perfect. How do you get the companies to bet, you know, get this? Because quite often you have a CSI department and it's one group of people who worry about this sort of thing. We're really suggesting here it should be the whole company. It should be involved in the DNA. How do you drive this inclusive innovation in organizations which are a bit departmentalized? I mean, this this is that's not an easy solve. We understand what we understand what goes wrong, but the solve is 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 very difficult. Um, the you know the best way that that I found is the first thing is taking executives out into market. The first thing is don't try to build new business models um, from an ivory tower. We would take uh, 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 executives on taxis and we would spend days out in market in people's homes, in their stores, uh, uh, watching, uh, you know, a big market that, that the clients I was working with were trying to tap into was mass markets in townships. We've got dense populations. Um, go out there and really build empathy with your market. Uh, get your executives to feel and see the rhythm of life and what people go through. Until that empathy connection is made, it's very difficult to build a, relative, a, a, a relevant business model. And it's also difficult to expect someone outside your organization to have the empathy. Because when you bring that model back into the organization, that innovation just dies a horrible death. You know, that not invented here syndrome. So it's, it's really about getting your executive team and your teams designing the models to feel empathy and connect with the market through, through journey mapping, uh, through persona development, but really spending time there. Um, that's, that's the first one. The second I would say is educate yourself. There's so much amazing material on companies like Semex, uh, Unilever, Nestle, Nestle in the YES program has an amazing uh, model that they've been driving over several years. Um, you know, how do you integrate this inclusive innovation as a core part of your business model? Um, and, and, we, and, you know, these successful examples, I mean, one of the first most basic examples was the Gillette razor, the, the, the five cent laser, uh, razor in India, uh, you know, that allowed rural people with very limited income to be able to shave. Uh, mm. And that was because Unilever had, uh, uh, um, the company had sent people out into markets, Procter & Gamble, not Unilever, excuse me, had sent people out into market where they, they understood that people were trying to shave with very little water. Uh, people didn't have the disposable income to be able to buy the sort of razor they were selling. And that innovation came directly out from PNG spending time in market. And then of course, opening up to open innovation networks and crowdsourcing your ideas. There are a whole lot of examples, Lego Kuso, that you know, Lego models were made from uh, customers going onto a site and giving a like to consumer ideas. Hey, we want a back to the future Lego set. 10,000 likes on Lego Kuso and Lego would then make a back to the future set. So, so this sort of crowdsourcing, open innovation and empathy led innovation um, is a way to drive that inside of organizations. But it does require a massive culture change because serving mass market segments well means mm. you've got to shift the way you measure yourself. You need patient capital. You need to understand you're going to make money when you reach scale. Um, but the South African market, I mean, when Capitec Bank came about in South Africa, it was a huge wake up call for the other banks who thought that the market was saturated and were just fighting for the same small group of clients. And Capitec Bank blew that open um, and was, was opening accounts for people at an, at an incredible rate. Um, and that, that, that competition shook up the financial services sector. And we see some really great financial service innovations in South Africa. I mean, it's far more sophisticated than financial services in Canada, 
which is a first world country in the G7. Yep. Um, but we're, we're way ahead on that. People Question still write from... checks out here, Colin. No, I can't believe that. I'm not even going down that route because um, <laughs> you know, we interviewed um, Bank South Africa's CEO um, recently and, and he's just come, his previous work experience was in Canada. It was incredibly depressing, I think, for Canadians, very, very exciting for us in South Africa about how far we are ahead. Seren, the great question here, I'm hoping this is, um, I don't know what I'm hoping for. I, f I fear the answer is going to be quite quick. I guess I'm not hoping for that, but it does give us time to get some of the other questions. Based on your experience in Canada now, are there exemplars or outliers in SA that are on a par with global benchmarks as far as innovation in the public space goes? Aside from yes, so yes is obviously very good. Do you know of anything else in SA that's uh, world renowned? Um, I mean, Harambi, Harambi does some great work on preparing young people for um, for the world of work. Um, they they they've done some some good things. Uh, Conservation South Africa, like I described, is a very big yes partner. Um, they do some really interesting work, and they're a global NGO. Um, there, there are a couple of examples. Is was that question around the NGO space? Seren will add to that in a minute. I'm not sure. I'm just reading it from the thing. While uh, Seren poses or um, thinks about whether to go and add to that question, um, another one here from Shane Tashmir. Does this then shift the role of leadership? So to create platforms of trust, so that we invite diversely knowledgeable minds to contribute towards an objective. I guess moving from dictatorial hierarchical to something a bit more. Um, flatter i mean i think that is that is going to help no matter where you are um and no matter what country you're in but particularly in south africa the most successful yes programs that we had was when we got the ceo to buy in when the ceo understood that their role here for for future economic development for future prosperity of the country meant in the short term you needed to do things differently you needed to say, okay, this is an investment. This is not going to make us money directly in the quarter. Uh, it was rejecting the notion of quarterly profit and saying, what is the long-term benefit and, 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 and shift in mindset that we've got to make? How do we play for the long game? And when we saw that shift in leadership mindset, we had some of the most successful YES programs. Like the, the Nestle program, because I see there's a question um, uh, that's asked about, you know, how do these yes youth play a role in water, mobility, infrastructure, etc. So let's uh, take the example of Nestle. Nestle um, uh, had these, these really impoverished rural communities around their, their plants in KZN. They used their yes youth to remove wattle, which is uh, uh, not an indigenous species, it's an invasive species. But the problem with wattle is it also ties up the water systems. Um, in, in quite water scarce areas. And so these yes youth were put to work to remove the wattle from those ecosystems. By removing the wattle, they started to see water flowing. So immediate uh, benefits on the sustainability front. They then taught these young people to dry the wattle out and to turn it into cattle feed and then started buying this from these young people. So starting to get them into an entrepreneurial journey around how they could take this and turn it into a business. And their investment didn't stop with just the Yes Youth. They built an entire ecosystem of support around these communities with uh, com uh, um, uh, uh, digital um, programs, the infrastructure for the digital programs. So they built little mini um, uh, labs with computers, um, trying to get the other yes youth to be trainers and uh, um, uh, coaches inside of that community. So, so there was a, a real long-term thinking by the management uh, and the leadership to say, how do we support the communities around our plant? Because our plant functioning and the security of our plant is dependent on the prosperity uh, of the communities around. And how do we start to get people involved in the supply chains? Um, so that the communities are benefiting and prospering from the supply chain involvement that they have. So, so that's the sort of leadership shift, the shift in mindset and business model, turning your, your, your good work into part of your core strategy. And mm. so you're doing good and doing well, um, and which is a very easy thing to say, you know, do good, do well. Um, but these are the sorts of models that make them real. 
Now we've got a lot of other questions that's going through this and I can't believe 40 minutes has gone already. I'm disgusted about how quickly time goes. It's most unfair. Maybe it's a, a sort of an age thing. I do want to take a, a pivot there and we'll try to come back. I particularly want to get back to a question that Harry's asked, but we'll come back to that if we've got time. Next 10 minutes, I want to just leap back in time. You started off in a completely different field. You started off in dentistry. Could you explain how you go from dentistry or even what your interest was that and then what the progression was? Because I really want to hear a bit about your journey, because where you are now and what you've done is obviously exceptional. Where you started was really, really impressive, too, but it's a very narrow field. And somehow you've made this branch and you've done it being female in a way which was at the time predominantly basically um, set up with a bunch of middle aged white men who are controlling the process that you've gone through. But let's start with dentistry. How on earth did you go from dentistry to uh, to yes and off to Canada? I, I mean, I loved I loved medicine. I loved studying the human body, and I think that's just made me a scientist at, at heart. Um, but working in private practice, I realized that my brain was stimulated through um, you know collaborative work and and uh, innovation. And I so I, I did an MBA. I won a scholarship that was the universe telling me I was on the right track. I want a scholarship. That's quite a big call. Cool. Sorry to interrupt. That's quite a big call cool to step out of a successful uh, family practice and go off on a self-funded MBA. How, how did that come about? Well, thankfully, I didn't have to self-fund because I won a scholarship to do it. I entered a competition that Gibbs had and uh, wrote a test or two and um, did a video. There was a video submission where I was the president. I, I made myself the president of the United States of Africa. Um, and described as this president of uh, the most resource rich continent on the planet, how that could be harnessed to, to drive growth and development. Um, I did the, the MBA and that was where my love affair with innovation really started. And straight after the MBA, I got thrown by Gibbs into this European Union Global Innovation Networks project. Um, and then that, that led to a faculty position in innovation at Gibbs uh, and, and quite a thriving consulting practice in inclusive innovation. Um, so you, you make it sound really easy though, but I mean, it can't have been that easy because when you were doing dentistry, you've now jumped across to an MBA, you've written uh, a paper on world, effectively on a, on a subject, a topic that you've got no knowledge about. How did you go and put yourself into the space where you could actually do that and have the confidence to feel that it would be accepted? So first of all, being at Gibbs was, was massive, like finding yourself at this, um, this watering hole of amazing thinkers and speakers. Um, so I was exposed to the network of the most frontier thinkers in the country. Um, through the Global Innovation Networks program, we did uh, studies across 15 countries, case studies and surveys. I, I had to read a lot. Uh, I always make the joke, my daughters, when they would have to draw their mommy at school, um, would always have a laptop almost as part of my body. <laughs> you, you know, uh, they would draw me with a laptop in my hands. And, uh, you know, I had to, I, it was a very steep learning curve for me. And I had to work a lot harder um, to clock up the experience and knowledge buckets uh, um, that people working in the space had had. Um, but, but you'll be amazed, you know, you can be in a job in business for years and not learn anything. But if you, if you shift your mindset and say, I want to learn, um, there, there's just incredible opportunity for us to be able to access the knowledge, the podcast, the TED Talks, the, the journal articles. Um, and of course, the MBA was instrumental in building that, the, those knowledge buckets. But it was a, it was a period of, of steep learning and a lot of investment. Um, in, in getting myself ready to, to enter the business world. Did you feel that you were at a disadvantage to your male colleagues? Um, I absolutely believed that I wasn't as good. I walked into the first MBA class and had an incredible sense of imposter syndrome. Um, I'm told a lot of women have this and I still have it till today. I, I walk into a space and never feel like I should be there. And one of my personal development uh, journeys um, is to say, that's okay. You, you know, you, everybody starts somewhere um, and you can build that knowledge. And hopefully over time that imposter syndrome starts to dilute. Uh, but I still feel it today. I don't think it's a battle that, that many women 
um, overcome quickly uh, and, and it follows them <laughs> even when they have 15 years under the belt, uh, it still follows you. It's, it's you know, we, our societal programming, um, our societal programming is very difficult to dismantle, uh, but dismantle we must. Do you feel like it was, you know, just something that um, you had as an internal fear, or do you think there was genuine bias and, and uh, genuine advantages that your male colleagues had starting in Gibbs and looking forward? I think the advantage that males have, particularly in South Africa, it's a very patriarchal society. Uh, the entire the entire wiring of men is to believe that they belong. Um, and I mean, this is layered over centuries of roles in society. So absolutely, they have an advantage in the system has been set up by men for men. Um, and, and, you know, I, I would not say that men have had an advantage. I've had a privileged upbringing. I've been to private schools. I've had fantastic opportunities for education in South Africa and globally. Um, so, so I've had that opportunity, but, but it's the social, uh, the social wiring and, the, and the, the social construction that is always going to have a woman needing to prove herself first before she's taken seriously. I would walk into uh, rooms with executives where I was the Indian female and I knew, uh, I could see it on their faces. I had to work very hard for the first 15 minutes. Um, I had to almost put on a whole show and dance um, uh, to, to prove myself. And then after 15 minutes, I would see people going, ah, okay, maybe she does know what she's talking about. Um, mm -hmm. But you have to put that extra effort in up front. And I, I remember it was an, we always had evaluation sheets after whatever program we did. And uh, I remember there was a, a comment in Afrikaans, plain bottle key groot gif, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, small bottle, strong poison. Um, but that was if you were always judged by the small bottle um, and, and you, you, had to, you had to prove your poison. Um, basically. I do want to call in, there's just a couple of things that I would love to just quickly touch on. R Labs, absolutely. Someone's mentioned Marlon's R Labs, a huge fan. In fact, I asked my daughter to intern for him. Um, he's done some really cool work. Uh, one of my favorite products that, that, that Yes actually used um, was the Zlato reward points, which gave young people who did volunteer work in their communities a digital currency to be able to use on things. So Marlon's doing some, some incredible stuff. I, I also love the question about diets in communities where people are just, we, we one of the only countries in the world that has obesity and malnutrition as this double-edged sword that impacts people because we have people just eating empty calories in, in, in our uh, rural and low-income communities. Um, please take a look at what YES is doing, particularly the Saldana Hub. We have created hydroponics, aquaponics farms, which are 4,000 fish in tanks that fish water is feeding a closed loop system. It's feeding a whole lot of fields um, of, of uh, veggies, uh, spinach, lettuce. Um, young people are doing this high tech farming, learning how to package, and that produce is being sold out to retailers and restaurants in that, uh, in that region. Please take a look. It's, it's um, a lot of our partners like Africa to Kun uh, and YES are working on programs that bring 4IR into communities, 3D printing, drone technology and drone pilots licenses. We're training township youth to do that. Um, and of course, uh, farming techniques are, 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 are very big. So these are, these are all such important things. We've got people asking about mobility infrastructure, um, water, financial services, farming, uh, 4IR tech, young people by training them can be vectors that take these technologies into their communities. We're asking township economies to compete and we've got them on the back foot on the technology frontier. We are not gonna be able to see those businesses competing and creating jobs and innovating if we don't allow for the infrastructure and the talent to bring that into those communities um, to make them more competitive. There's so many good questions here, Colin. 
Um, oh, well, what we'll have to do is to see if A, we can answer any, I won't put it on the spot and uh, commit to it, but if we can answer some of them offline and reply back, I'm very happy to help you to do that. Or maybe you've got colleagues, as a lot of them relate to yes, um, where we can chat with those guys and see if we can do that. But let's see how we get on. We've got 10 minutes left. We do like to, to finish on time. It was really my last question. You just cut in there. It's just, I want to know what I and my colleagues, male colleagues need to be doing in terms of trying to assist in breaking the bias. So often it's about what women should be doing. I want to know what we need to be doing as guys. So, I mean, I could say a whole lot of things um, about my personal experiences and, and the, the problem is that we have a lot of these webinars where women talk about their experiences. I've, I've experienced sexual harassment in places I shouldn't have. Um, I know that when I walk into a room, uh, I have to work harder to prove myself. And mine is not a unique experience. You will, most women will tell you the same. This doesn't, just, just saying it doesn't help. What, what I've seen is that our wiring, our programming is so deeply embedded that without creating um, a dedicated diversity, equity and inclusion plan that involves getting professionals to come in and help you design a program to reprogram you. Um, it's not going to happen just with a desire. I want to be a better human. I want to be um, more inclusive in my organization and, and, and think about how I can protect and uh, allow for women to thrive in my organization or people of color or wh whatever, whatever the diversity is that you're working towards. And it's different in different countries and different firms. W without a real program that helps you think about how you rewire people's thinking and build that empathy um, is very, very difficult to shift this. And there's a lot of lip service applied. There's a lot of, oh, in Women's Month, let's have the webinar and let's spend the money and tell everybody how, you know, what we're doing. But there's very little deep change and shift because that stuff's hard. Human mm. behavior is hard. And uh, there are people who are very skilled at this, who've done it for other companies that will come in and help you create a program that isn't just a day in Women's Month, um, but is an ongoing program of, of redirecting the organization's structures, incentives, um, work hours, um, and, and, and changes behaviors through a longer program of empathy building. Are you starting to see the business schools? I mean, you do a massive amount of reading. You obviously know Gibbs very well. You deal with a lot of business schools. Are you start? I've always felt they're part of the problem. Are you starting to see them uh, transform in the way that they're educating business leaders? Um, and it's not necessarily just in terms of bias, but actually going broader in terms of this whole inclusiveness that we're talking about, about making sure it is the, the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit, you know, uh, purpose driven, because I think they really need to be held accountable for teaching companies initially to go and focus on shareholder value and profit. And that's created a lot of the problems and the stickiness that we're facing to try and move now. All of that community is men. It's all investors. They're all sitting in banks and financial services institutions who are in turn employing the board members who are coming in and saying we've got to chase profit. It's really hard to, to change as a large institution when you've got that weight of pressure on top of you. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we're seeing it. We're seeing BlackRock saying, you know, companies we invest in need to have females on the board. So we're starting to see um, we're starting to see the pressure uh, being raised on, on companies to be more diverse and, and to show that, um, you know, business schools, no two business schools are alike, and they're doing this to different degrees. I think Gibbs is particularly good at driving this agenda. Um, uh, but, you know, around the world, yes, I would argue that more progressive business schools are turning this into leadership and uh, leadership behaviors and diversity, equity, and inclusion, certainly in Canada, it is a massive, massive theme. Um, you know, companies are appointing uh, entire portfolio, entire uh, groups of people to portfolios around DEI. Um, so, you know, whereas if you go to the States and you go to certain uh, uh, states in the States, 
there's very little progress being made. So, so Colin, there's no blanket answer to that. I, I think we're seeing it at different degrees. There is a, there's a whole lot more out there, um, but whether that change is deep enough and, um, uh, you know, if it's, if it's really making the tough calls and putting the resources behind doing this in the longer term, it, it's, it's, it's a much longer journey. This is not something that's going to be resolved. Um, There's still too much lip service in the space. But yes, but your point about business schools um, training new leaders in this is a critical one. Mm. Hey, Carabo, welcome back. Mm. Really, really exciting, um, Colin and Tashmini. I think um, one thing we do know, this is the beginning of a conversation because, um, and we probably need a lot more of an hour just looking at the, the kinds of questions as well. That's just, um, Colin, just for me, three big takeaways. Um, uh, Tash, it, you are, thank you for challenging us in South Africa in business right now. Inclusive organi- innovation has to be front and center. And some of those learnings that uh, firstly, we've got to take leaders along and leaders have to start. And you talked about that empathetic connections. I think what I loved was this don't build product in ivory towers. Make those empathy connections. Um, to all the ladies on the call, I think your story and your journey is, resonates for us where you know you come in and you feel like an imposter. But um, I think you've, been, you've challenged us. The knowledge is available. So fill your knowledge bucket. It's not enough to say I don't have anyone that's sharing information. You can go outside. And I certainly am, am, am challenged when it comes to how we ensure women thrive in our organizations. And you talk about designing a program to reprogram you. I think a lot of us are using our intent and saying we want to bring women in and, and, and let them participate but they're people that know what they're doing. Absolute, thank you so much, Colin. We've covered quite a number of areas, but I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone on this call. We've all got a nugget and at least the first step on a way to begin. Tashmir, last thoughts on your side. Well, I'm very, very thrilled that Carabo is a female CEO and she's breaking the bias by just being here and in her position. Um, I look at these questions and there's, there were so many questions around inclusive innovation and how we can use young people to drive mm. economic development and use them as the massive resource that they are. I, I, feel, I feel as though that, Colin, that you've got a group of people hungry to try yeah. to initiate that change um, yeah. who want to go deeper into that economic development and, 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 and using young people. That, that almost feels like something you've got to do next. Um, I'm so sorry I couldn't get to all of those questions. I, uh, I miss, miss South Africa uh, terribly. Um, I, I'm not a ritualistic religious person, but uh, you know, someone once said it's very hard to do God's work in Australia. Well, is, you're know, very similar in Canada. The systems do work here, um, but you know, being able to grow my career on a global platform and a global innovation platform is is just um, amazing. But for those of you in South Africa, the the work to be done there is 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 big, um, and I hope that conversations like this continue to drive fresh thinking um, to, to to change things and just leapfrog. Uh, in, in our development journey uh, back home. So thank you for creating this platform um, to, to surface some of those ideas and, and plans for how, how we can go about that. Hashmir, thank, thank you very much for joining us. So I started off with uh, you saying that who wants to dial in for some women uh, who happens to live in Canada. I think just from listening to the conversation, we've eradicated that. Has anyone ever said that again in the future? And as I said at the start, and I hope people agree on the call. Once they see where you're placed now in terms of what you've achieved for yes, now you're in Canada doing something on a bigger scale. I dare say in the next decade or two, we're going to see things that make these look like drops in the ocean if you carry on at this, this rate that you're going at. And then for everyone on the call, we'll let you know via email about uh, future sessions with future guests. 
one thing I do like to do after these calls is just make a list of the learnings that I took out of it about, you know, the things I've taken away. If you want to share any of them with me, it makes actually make my, my life a bit easier in case I miss something. I'm very happy to build them into an article that I want to post around this because there were just so many uh, pieces to get out there. Bringing leaders together, uh, learning to unlearn, start with a beginner's mindset. Uh, how do you create the channels, opening the access ranks, putting empathy, and there was just so many uh, that we need to get down on paper. Maybe there's a book there for you, Tashmir. But anyway, we've hit the hour. Thank you very much, and I hope you have an awesome week. I hope you have an awesome month, and we'll chat to you all again soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.